All right. Okay. So this is a look at Arizona science standards. Uh, my name is Rebecca Gorelli. I'm the science and STEM specialist at the department. And I did put a link in the chat, make sure it's open. Thank you for introducing yourselves. And we already kind of went over this, just leave the chat on, make sure it's on for everyone and stay muted until the end when it's Q and A time. So here is our dashboard. Hopefully you have made this force copy. And so since I have no idea if you've opened this or not, I need a little feedback. So in the chat, if you have it open and it's ready to go, can you type done into the chat? Just so I can get some anecdotal data. Perfect. Thank you. All right, lots of duns. Feeling good. All right, and I'll drop it one more time because once I get going, I gotta forget to do it. All right. So here's how this works. As we as we you know engage in this learning experience, I'm gonna be saying things like open resource number two or number four or number five. I'm gonna identify them by number. The ones that are grayed out are the ones you're actually gonna open. All the other links are ones that you might wanna take a look at on your own, or I've used them to build this learning experience. So if you're like, hey, where'd you get that? All the things I use to build this are literally in here. So this is all the resources. And just to remind you, this webinar, maybe not remind you, but if you didn't know, this is our basic beginner webinar that brings us through three-dimensional instruction that has to do with our standards. So we're not gonna dive deep. We are going to stay at high level because we have additional webinars that will break out the three dimensions and we have one on what's called phenomena-based instruction. So you're gonna hear me talk about, we're all gonna talk about the three dimensions, but we do have webinars on each one of those. So if anytime you're like, oh my gosh, I don't know these things, that's okay. Come back and do another learning experience with us. But we also have all of these recorded on our website. And let me orient you to the dashboard real quick. So when you look at the dashboard, up here, this is a link to our main science standards page. That's where you'll find all of the resources that go with the standards, including the recorded webinars. This page is a brand new web page we have built out over the past like six months with tons and tons of resources. This link will bring you right to where you can register for all those webinars I just talked about. And if you're wondering, I did put a PDF of the slide deck in here. So if you're like, man, I really want your slides. I already made you one uh, copy. They're in PDF form and the slide deck is right here. And the webinar pathways that I'm describing are right here. So everything you need is one click away. All right, let's get into the learning. We'll come on back. So we are here. If you feel like you know these things, well, then you would go to track two. Really, these are the more advanced webinars we have. And then track three would kind of be the even more advanced webinars. So when you're trying to figure out what should I sign up for, this is a tool that can help you think about that. And we also just wanted to make an announcement. Um, we did this 2020 year in review. We were very successful last year with um, over 2,000 people coming to our webinars, which is really exciting. So thank you, thank you, thank you to all of you who come and work with us in this space. But also super exciting, if you're a seventh through 12th grade science or math teacher, the presidential awards are uh, open. You can nominate someone, you can apply yourself. Um, and here is the link. So you just click it, you apply. It's a pretty rigorous process, but it's an incredible experience. So if you're interested, that link is in there. And reminder, I did give you the slides um, in number one in the dashboard. All right, so take a moment and read over the goals for today. So this is basic stuff, basic introduction to our standards. We're gonna start by coupling these two things together before we really dive a little bit into the standards. So we're gonna talk about the timeline and the shifts. That's gonna be our first thing, so here we go. But before we do that, let's be mindful that we are in this space together and it's an important space. And I can't do this alone, so I really need your help contributing and honoring everyone's voice 
active, respectful, listening, speaking. If you can help someone in the chat, dive in and help someone in the chat. I am gonna ask you to do a couple interactive things like in a Jamboard or a Google Doc. So I just ask that you commit to the group by contributing to the learning and being active. Um, so I hope everyone can agree to those things. And really the whole purpose of us being here and learning about these new standards is that we have new standards that come from, oh, that just did something weird come from this framework of K-12 science education. This is one of the major research documents that we developed our standards from. And so in this framework, it really, which is a contemporary piece of research, it really talks about how three-dimensional standards provide access and equity, right? There's a whole chapter, chapter 11 on this. And it's all about providing opportunity and spaces for all kids, all cultures, everyone to get together in a safe community to you know make sense of the world around them that's what we're doing here so let's just do a quick check-in this is a spectrum and no worries if you're down on a or b it doesn't matter all experience is welcome but for me to understand how much i need to dive into things this will help me so in the chat think about where you are with the standards in general your comfort level are you on the a side like just getting started or are you all the way on the E side or maybe you're somewhere in the middle and that's okay, wherever you are. And I saw someone just joined, whoever just joined, please open that link in the chat. Okay, so we have some folks in the middle, some just starting out, which is why you are here, fantastic. Okay, all right, good. If I had a ton of E's, I'd probably send you to a different webinar. So I'm glad you are all here. This is the space for you. All right. And thank you. And, and thanks for being honest about that. All right, let's keep going. So the first thing, which I did link some things in the dashboard, number two will be this document. This is our implementation timeline. Number three gives you resources about the new science assessment called AZ Sci. So let me just break this down for a moment. Our standards were adopted over here in 2018. We are actually in year two of implementation. And what that means is, you know, districts across the state are, are in various places. And so you just kind of have to think about like, where are you in your district or your charter or your wherever you are? This is year two. And with this, um, Ames science test was taken away. Um, we're not gonna be doing that. So that's why that is now crossed out. However, what is still as of today going to continue to happen is what's called the forms field test. And that is the new Arizona science test basically provides, the kids are gonna get the items, they're gonna interact with the items, answer the items, but they will not be scored. It's not for accountability. It's not for bonus points or report cards or any of those things. It's basically benchmark data for the assessment company to see how the kids did and make changes before we get to year three, which is when the brand new science assessment comes out, which is next year. Now, if you're wondering about this science assessment, everything we're gonna discuss today is literally going to be on there. It's a three-dimensional test and our standards are what's called three-dimensional. So the way it's gonna work is fifth grade will be assessed on standards from third, fourth, and fifth. So it's a grade band test, not just a grade level test. Eighth grade will be um, assessed on the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade standards. And 11th grade will be assessed on nine, 10, and 11, what's called the essential standards. And if you're like, I don't know what that means, don't worry. We're gonna talk about it later. But it's really the essential ones, there's 28 of them. And we'll walk through why are they called essential? What's different about them? We'll do that a little bit later. But just to ground you in what we're doing, this is year two. Next year is the final year of implementation. And I know some folks are just joining in the transition now, and that's okay. So if you're wondering about AZ Sci in the dashboard, right here in number three, we're not gonna spend time going and diving into that website, but there's a whole website now with links to what's called a resource suite. So if you wanna see a sample test, um, documents, supporting documents for the assessment, you wanna dive in and learn that stuff, here is where you click and it'll take you right there and there's a sample test and everything. 
So just want to keep moving. Oh yeah, I forgot that was clicking. All right, so here's our first task. With these new standards comes pretty big instructional shifts. It's, it's a mindset and, and what we do and how we interact with students is going to change. And to help us think through this, we're gonna do an activity. There's this amazing document called the New Vision for Science Education. And I linked it for you in number four in the dashboard. So please go to the dashboard and then open this, number four. And I'll need some feedback. Can you type ready in the chat when you are ready to go for instructions? Perfect. Thank you. All right, looks like we're pretty ready. Okay, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go into what we call the alone zone. This is you by yourself. You're gonna spend three minutes reading this document. Um, how do you get out of the Zoom to the dashboard? Um, you can minimize your Zoom screen. So click the minimize button and your Zoom screen has, you can shrink it or grow it. So I hope that helps. All right. In the alone zone, what that means, you're going to think by yourself. You're going to construct and commit to your own thinking first before we share with anybody else. This is a very critical step with our new standards. Whenever we engage students with something new, we have to give them think time by themselves before you say, turn and talk to a partner. So alone zone, you're going to go in the alone zone and you are going to read this. Oops, not that. You're gonna read this for three minutes and I'll put on a timer. After that, what we're going to do is you're gonna think about as you read this and on the left-hand side of this document is kind of the old way, the traditional way of teaching that was uh, familiar with our 2004 standards. So that's kind of what we're getting away from. And then what are we moving towards? So the right side is really where we are moving towards on this side. So you're gonna go in the alone zone, you're gonna read a little bit. You're gonna think for a second about what, what like three to five things really stuck out with you. Because when we all come back together, we're gonna to go into a collaborative jam board and share our ideas. So I'm gonna start the timer for alone zone right now and three minutes to read and think about the new vision. Okay, timer starting now. There's about a minute and 20 seconds left. And I see someone just joined. So if you haven't opened a copy of this dashboard yet, please do. We're actually in, um, we are in number four in the dashboard. I'm 
25 seconds left. So start thinking about a few things that really stuck with you about these shifts in instruction that come with our new standards. All right, time is up. So now what we're gonna do, hopefully you had enough time to think about it. We are gonna move to Jamboard. And I know some of you are probably really familiar and use it and other people may not have used it. So I'm just gonna go over a couple things. Jamboard is basically a collaborative whiteboard uh, with Post-its. And what we're gonna use on the left, you'll see a toolbar when we get in there in just a second. You're only gonna use the sticky note um, and we're gonna use the color blue, actually not yellow, but blue. And then you're gonna use the pen tool and I'll show you what we're gonna do in a minute. Now this button up at the top where it moves to like another frame or another slide, we're not gonna use that button at all cause we're only gonna use one frame. And so we're gonna do what's called moves in a Jamboard. And if you haven't done this with kids yet, I use this in all the science like lessons we do. So if you keep coming to our webinars, you'll see us use these moves in Jamboard a lot. And a move is basically directions. And so what we're gonna do, you're gonna think about the things that stuck with you, what resonated with you. You're gonna pick three things that you're gonna put on a post-it, but you're gonna make three post-its, one per idea. And so um, you're gonna use blue. And once everyone is gonna start sprinkling their post-its, it's gonna start to slow down at some point. So when it slows down, you're gonna use the pen tool and you're gonna circle. And I'm gonna do some organizing of some of your post-its possibly if I'm in your Jamboard. So if you see me doing that, I'm just putting like ideas together, nothing crazy. But once it slows down, you're gonna circle ones that are new, like, oh, I didn't think about that, like a new idea. And if you see a post-it that was very similar to yours, put a check mark on it. Like, yep, I agree with you there. And this is just a collaborative way. And we can use this with students when we're engaging in collaborative spaces digitally. And so the way this works is you're going to go, and if you look at number five, you're gonna use your birth month. So if you're January, February, March, April, you're gonna click that one, May, June, July, August, that one, September, October, November, December, that one. And those are in the dashboard. And so, I'm gonna give us about four minutes to do this. And when you get on the Jamboard, you can start, make one, just click on the post-it, turn it blue, and then one idea for each post-it. So try to post three, and when it slows down, just follow the directions, and I put the directions in the Jamboard. Lynn, we're in number five in the dashboard and you need to choose by your birthday month. So in the dashboard, you can see they're all linked here. Whatever your birthday is, you just click that one and that's your jam space. And as a reminder, I am alone. I do not have support. So please, if you're troubleshooting things and I'm, I'm like, on, I'm, I'm in the middle of talking about it, please just hang on until there's like a pause. And if you just joined, I saw someone just joined. Here is the uh, dashboard link. All right, look at this beautiful jam coming together. All right, so we see things like student-centered driven, student driven, yeah. Metacognition, phenomena, yep. No more worksheets, hooray. Personal accountability, not saying all worksheets are bad. I still love my, my data table kind of sheets that I give my kids. Student-led investigations with teacher guidance. Textbooks are no longer necessary. Providing provisions for all learners. Okay, so once posting slows down, just grab the pen tool. So you just click the tool, 
pick, doesn't matter what color or size. And if you see something new that you didn't think about, circle it. If you had something that you shared with someone else, you're just gonna put a check mark on it. New things, you'll just circle. And so this just provides us a space to look at each other's ideas, think about how our ideas connect to one another and gives us a protocol to do that. All right, I'll go check out another jam real quick, see how we're doing. Wow, this one is amazing. I'm gonna go. Wow, look at all these ideas. Supporting all learners. Kids will apply. Yes, that application piece, open-ended questions, inquiry, not using worksheets. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna do that. Yeah. I agree with you there. Questions about phenomena. Nice. Okay, perfect. So as we can see. It's about open-ended curiosity-based learning. I love this curiosity-based learning. Thank you for including that. Multiple resources, student-centered. Giving that one a check. All right, let's, um, let's finish up in about 30 seconds and then we'll come on back and we'll move forward. And just take a look at the shifts. This is gonna be different than traditional style of teaching. It is definitely not the scientific method. All right, about 10 more seconds. Looks like that jam is coming along. This jam is coming along. Perfect. All right, so thinking about those shifts, and if you can come on back to your Zoom screen and reorient to the slide deck, that was a great first step into understanding the actual instructional shifts that come with these new standards. And so here's another visualization. We did a word cloud um, in one of these activities with teachers in Coolidge. And they had the same sort of thinking like on this side, take a look at this, oversimplification, just asking kids to memorize vocabulary and not connected to anything else. This is what we called with our old standards, learning about science. One right answer, teacher sent it, textbooks, teacher led. Do you see how many times teacher is in this space? Teacher, 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 teacher. It's not about us and what we know. It's about the students. So as we shift to the new standards, look at this word cloud. Open-ended, engaging, exploring, explaining, discussion, evidence, systems, and student-centered. So the, the major shift is from actually learning about science in like isolated facts and vocabulary to what we call figuring out, making sense of the world around them. And so with this, I'd like to talk about two labels for instruction. And these are actually um, frames that are on opposite ends of a spectrum. So on the one side is what we have the information frame, which is our old standards, the performance objectives. They were focused putting the teacher out there as the disseminator of information. Students are the receivers of that information. And that's kind of it. It's about memori memorization and rote facts. And students are just focused on knowing that stuff. And science is really just portrayed as a body of facts. And assessments are focused on right answers. This is the knowing about side. But where we're going and where we're all just starting to get towards, if you're in this webinar, this is kind of your first taste of learning about what's called sense-making. We're gonna talk about sense-making a little bit later. The sense-making frame is on the completely opposite side of that spectrum, and that's where we're progressing towards, where the teacher is focused on helping students develop conceptual understanding, where students are focused on actually figuring something out and understanding something, not just vocabulary, not just facts, not just the scientific method. Science is actually a way of making sense of something. And assessments are focused on evidence to support what you're saying and what you're trying to figure out. So again, there's that shift and we're, we're gonna move towards sense-making instead of just focusing on 
vocabulary and isolated facts. And so let's just do a, a quick review of like how do standards work since this is a webinar on standards. And so I'm gonna ask you to just take one minute and read over these three columns. And then in the chat box, just what's the difference between standards, curriculum and instruction? So I'll give us uh, 30 seconds and then feel free to respond in the chat. All right, and if you've read it, just think about like, if you were gonna explain this to someone else, how would you describe the difference between these three in like a short sentence? Try to explain the difference in nine words or less in the chat. Thank you, Lynn. Excellent. What do they know? How to learn it? Tools to help them understand? Board adopted school teachers. I like it. All right, good. And as you're writing in the chat, and everybody can take a look at the trends and see what people are doing in the chat, I'm just going to push us along and just go over it real quick. Yeah, standards are obviously what do the students need to know and understand, be able to do. Curriculum are those resources and instruction are the methods. And who is adopting these? Yep, somebody said this in the chat. This is at the state level. This is at the local level. We are a local control state. And then who is responsible for the instruction? It gets down to the individual teacher level. Yeah, Christine, nice, thank you so much. So remember, we're in standards world today. We're not gonna talk about I'm not going to walk you through a lesson or engage you in a lesson today because that's not the focus. Um, we're just going to basic high level of like what is included in these standards. And so let's do a little history, little walk back in time and compare the old to the new. On this side, this is the performance objectives from our 2004 standards. Very different from what we now have, which are called content standards. So take Take a minute, read over the differences, and then on the next slide, we're gonna break it down a little bit more. All right, and hopefully that was enough time for you to read over the difference because we're gonna break it down. Here we go. Over here, we have our content standards versus the performance objectives. So take a minute and just do a side-by-side -side comparison. And then in the chat, what what's like, what's talking at you? What is the big difference between content standards, which are what we're now having versus the old performance objectives. So take a minute and whenever you're ready, respond in the chat after you've read over it. Ah, spiral, yes. We're gonna talk about the spiral a little bit later. Learning will be deeper, yep. It's multiple opportunities, absolutely. We no longer are gonna have that checklist. Yep, I did that, yep, we did that, yep, we did that. One and done, no longer exists. Not saying some of those skills aren't still embedded, they are, it's just not a checklist anymore. 
Yeah, open-ended, nice. Application of knowledge. Learning is connected and deep. Yeah, these are all great, you know, uh, things that resonated with you. Yeah, open-ended. And so really what's great about these standards is the depth of knowledge. Really, there's nothing lower than a DOK2. It doesn't even exist, really. So we're not just going to have these rote memorization facts. And vocabulary is a thing that we're not going to front load. We're going to open up and engage students, create a need for that vocabulary word, but they're going to experience it first. Then you layer in the word. So think about that as we go forward. And so let's just do a side-by-side -side comparison. Here is the old PO on the left. This is a fourth grade energy and magnetism. We're going to focus on PO2. And on the right, this is the way, same content. It's not like we have new science content, same content, but written in our new standards. So on the left, let's just read this. Construct series and parallel electric circuits. So I want you to think of like, what would be happening in that classroom? And the way I see it is the teacher may have provided a procedure and the materials and the students may sit there and go, okay, connect this, do this. Oh, we did all this, we create these circuits, bam, a light bulb goes on. And that is pretty shallow when you think about it. Following a procedure and just making sure they can do it, do I really know if the students can explain how that energy moves from place to place or how electric currents work or troubleshoot if I took out something in that circuit, how do I solve it? And so it's very shallow. But when we look at this one, it now says, develop and use a model that explains how energy is moved from place to place through electric currents. And do you see how this is bolded? It's bolded on purpose because that's what we call a science and engineering practice. And it's one of the three dimensions. To develop and use a model means I'm gonna make, I'm gonna initiate the model. I might draw it one time and write out an explanation, but then I'm gonna do more learning and I'm gonna talk to my neighbors and talk to and collaborate, come to consensus with my class. Then I'm gonna go back to my model and revise it and rewrite things. And maybe my teacher will layer in vocabulary then, but once I have experience and collaborated, now we layer in vocabulary. And then we have to explain how things move from place to place. So we're constructing an explanation as well. And when you think of DOK here, this is much more challenging than the PO. Same content, I'm still gonna use all these materials from building circuits, but the way I approach it and the way the students are immersed in it is gonna be completely different. All right, so now we're gonna move into what is this thing called three-dimensional science instruction? What is this thing called phenomena and what is sense making? And so just a little history, our standards were written from two research documents. This one on the left is called the framework for K-12 science education. On the right, this is called working with big ideas of science education. Now, the next generation science standards, the NGSS, the national standards are built off of this framework. So are the Arizona science standards. So that means we are going to have some things in common with NGSS. But because we in Arizona used an additional research document to build our standards, we are not an NGSS state. We did not adopt the next generation science standards. We are what is called a framework based state because our standards are mainly built on this thing called the framework, which is a research document. And so if you're wondering like, where can I get these books? They are both free and I gave them to you. It is number six right here. Both PDFs are here. They're available for download. So I just downloaded them and linked them for you. So both of those are there. I don't suggest reading this in one sitting. It is a massive text, um, but it's really important that you understand what's in these documents. And so to help you understand like why, why aren't we an NGSS state or how am I supposed to know whether or not I can use NGSS materials? And if you're having wonderings like that, we have built resources to help you understand how our standards correlate to the national standards. Two things I just wanna show you is we have a video set that I made that walks you through. It's a two-part video, short videos. 
on the differences between our standards and the next generation science standards. And they are linked right here in number seven. One's like eight minutes, I think, the other's like 13. So if you need to know a little bit more, you can do that on your own time. And then the next one, number eight, if you have not seen these planning tools we have, what we did is we took every single Arizona science standard and correlated it to a next generation science standard. So in this document, which is linked in the dashboard, and I might've messed up those numbers. Oh, it's number eight, I was right, okay. Um, let's look at this, this is a first grade standard. If you see an S here, this means a strong correlation. So here's the key, and it'll tell you what S means, it'll tell you what partial means, and if you see an NC, it means it's not correlated. So maybe don't use that resource. So we have these for every single grade level, and it is, it's on our website, and it's linked in here. It's called the planning tool. It's right here, number eight, complete set. So there they are. All right. And so let's dive in now that I explained that we are not in NGSS state, which is usually what people want to know. Is in this framework, there are dedicated chapters to these things called the three dimensions. So dimension one is the science and engineering practices. That's one of the three dimensions. That's in chapter three. Chapter four, dimension two is what's called the cross-cutting concepts. Chapter five, is the beginning of dimension three. These are called the core ideas. So there's physical, earth and space, and life sciences. So think of your content. And all of that comes from this text. And here's a visual representation. This is called the pinwheel. And the outside is one dimension in blue. Those are called the science and engineering practices. These are how we engage students in making sense of what we call phenomena which are naturally occurring events that happen in the real world all the time. Um, and so there are eight of them. If you look around the pinwheel, there are eight of them. Things like constructing explanations, developing models, asking questions, analyzing data. These are practices that we engage with the students to help them make sense of the phenomena. So you put them in the position of the scientist, in the position of the engineer, and they are the ones figuring it out and these are the practices that help them do that. In the green section are the seven cross-cutting concepts. These are the lenses through which we think about phenomena. We, these are tools that we provide to students like cause and effect, looking at patterns, energy and matter, systems and system models that help us gather more information and go, huh, let's look through that lens and look for some connections or patterns. So this is another layer of how we engage students. And in the yellow section is content. This is called the core ideas, large, broad ideas that fall under physical science, life science, and earth and space science. And to think about where engineering falls in, remember these blue ones are science and engineering practices. So you'll see things like defining problems or designing solutions. Those are engineering. And so I could talk about it all day long, but there's a video that is gonna do it for me and does a much better job and is really phenomenal at explaining these three dimensions. So we're gonna watch the video. As you watch the video, take a read over these questions because after the video, we're gonna respond in the chat. And I'm gonna teach you a strategy to get kids to respond in the chat called um, a waterfall. We'll do that later. So here's what we're gonna do. This video says NGSS. I know I just told you we're not an NGSS state, but remember our standards were built on the same framework as NGSS. NGSS and us have the three dimensions. So this video is actually perfect. So I'm gonna be quiet. I'm gonna go grab the video. Please read over these questions. And this, I did link this for you in the dashboard as well. If you wanna watch it later, it's from the teaching channel. So let me just make sure sound is on really quickly. Okay. All right. Oh my gosh, why is it? Oh no. All right, hang on. I have it downloaded. Let me just go grab it. I'll put you back in. Give me one sec. I have it downloaded. Thought I was signed in. Okay. 
one sec. This file. Okay. Got it. Okay. All right. Give me one sec to just reshare. All right. Now I can't find my Zoom. All right. Here it comes. No, why don't I see it there? One sec. Oh, All right, here it comes. All right, just let me know if you can see and hear it in the chat. I'm going to hit play. Okay. It's 1.2. When we learn things, it isn't for memorizing a piece of information. Just reciting science facts or principles is not what we want children to be able to do. We want them to be able to go out in the world and make sense of novel phenomena. So making sense of things really is engaging in a performance and saying, I need to construct an explanation of why or how this occurs. Okay, let's get started. Are you ready? 56. Throughout the few days, I want you to engage as the scientist, you as the student, you as the learner. If it was room temperature water, would it be behaving in the same way? What's the science behind this? What's happening? As teachers start focusing on the next generation science standards, they will be able to help students see science as it really is, that it's not just a set of steps and procedures. The real hope is that they can make a connection between what we do in the modeling of performances of science and what they do in their classroom. Oh, wow. In this day and age, one of the factors influencing the next generation science standards is the globalization, understanding we're in a global community. We're not kind of an isolated entity here. The next generation of science standards takes the vision from the framework for K-12 science education and puts it into a set of performance expectations. And it calls for the students to actively engage in science. It sets out parameters for science education, clear goals, along with describing the three dimensions that students can engage in to make sense of science. Three dimensions are the cross-cutting concepts, the science and engineering practices, and the disciplinary core ideas. Most of those ideas are not new. The integration of them, pulling those three dimensions together, is new. If we're going to have the kids doing that, instruction has to reflect that. What I'm walking away from today, kind of a big shift for me, is we can focus in on something very specific to help teach a much broader, bigger idea, that it actually helps the students be able to do that application to new scenarios, new situations. Cross-cutting concepts. There's seven of them. The way we've organized them is around causality, structure and function, systems, scale and proportion, change and stability, matter and energy, and then the last thing, patterns. These cross-cutting concepts are tools that you provide to the children, and they use those tools to make sense of phenomena. So we're looking for changes in the system. There's condensation on the outside. The cross-cutting concepts are a way of organizing the phenomena in terms of what the system is that's being studied. What did you define as your system? We included in our system also the surrounding air. The idea that there's a cause-effect relationship. It's causing the cloudiness. It's causing the bubbles to come off of the ice. It's going to get pushed in the direction of the wind, right? Mm -hmm. And finally, patterns used as evidence to support their explanations. So to me, the pattern is just the fluttering back and forth, right? Do you have a question in mind? Why that pattern, that the back, back and, and forth. forth pattern? What yeah. if we change the direction of the flag, if we turn it this way? Okay. I want to go inside and make a little paper flag that we can blow on and manipulate. The practices are a set of things that children do in engaging in science performances. Asking questions right here, that's what students do. 
As a professional teacher, you have to create an environment in which students are asking questions to help them make sense of things. Ready? 150. Why doesn't that ball return to that exact same level that you dropped it? Engaging students in the practices really does pique their curiosity and it helps them have a desire to go out and have more questions about the world, which asking questions is a practice. So it's something we want them to be able to do and be able to discover more about the world. What else contributes to it not reaching its maximum height that it started at? The pull of gravity. Gravity is still pulling it back down even though it's bouncing up. As learners, using evidence and using that evidence to construct explanations is important. I think having those experiences will really help students own the content. So more, more bounce, yeah. more energy in the bounce, and that's really the kinetic energy. The last dimension of the core ideas, and there's nothing new here. We don't want kids at the end of instruction to recite the core ideas. We want them to use them in science performances to make sense of novel phenomena, applying them to construct exclamations and develop arguments. So the alcohol is less dense than the ice, as you can see. The density in there is different. Oh, yeah. The core ideas in particular become valuable because we revisit them through every grade band, and they're moving forward in a very logical way. Those things we're asking them to do can be applied to more than just alcohol and water. It can be applied to cloud formation. It can be applied to condensation. Why? What's happening? I think what's exciting about the Next Generation Science Standards is this intersection of the three dimensions and that we're not just working on practices one day. You really are infusing the three dimensions within the classroom. One of the things that you've done is asking what if. By doing that, I have to be able to take what I know, what I've learned, looking at the models, looking at patterns, and applying them somehow to show that I understand what would happen if I changed a dynamic. It's been real helpful to remember that, you know, I can't do one without thinking about the other. No change, you should add that, right? That's how students are gonna be thinking about them as well. It's cute. It's my hope that this will be the reform in science education that not only gets students more proficient in science, but builds interest in science. All right, hang on, let me switch screens for a second. All right, so, whoops, hang on, I gotta do some rearranging of screens, okay. Hang on, sorry. All right. So coming on back from that very useful video, um, I just want you to think about, you know, one of these three questions that um, go with the video really is like, how do the standards represent a shift? What did the teachers in the video learn from engaging with three-dimensional science instruction? And how do the three dimensions work together? So I want you to think about one of these questions and we're gonna do what's called a waterfall chat. And so how this works is you're gonna just read the directions over here. Choose a question and I'll give you one minute to write. And so you're gonna literally write in the chat, but you're not gonna hit enter. So when the minute is up, you'll hear my timer go off and it'll go three, two, one, and then everyone's gonna hit enter and we're gonna watch all the answers and thoughts waterfall through the chat. And we're just gonna scan back through them and look for trends and patterns just to kind of look at what everyone's thinking. So I'm gonna start the timer at uh, one minute right now and just think about you know, what you take away from that video. If those questions are hindering you in any way, just type whatever you're thinking about the new standards and these three dimensions. One minute starts now. So remember, type your thoughts in the chat, but don't hit enter until the countdown. Thirty seconds. Thirty 
10 seconds. All right, so three, two, one, hit enter. Okay, so they just waterfalled. I'm gonna go through and look for some uh, trends, some patterns, asking questions. Yep, engaging in learning. Ah, I love this, Shannon. Focus on shifting from teacher-led to student-led. Yes, phenomena first, absolutely. We're gonna talk about phenomena in just a second. All right, and as you're looking at the chat, just scroll on through the waterfall and just look at look at what everyone's saying and identify some things. Application, deeper content, learning by discovery, perfect. All right, so let's move forward. And I'm just gonna, we're just gonna walk through each of the dimensions and just have a quick chat about it. Nothing crazy, because I think that video did a great job of explaining that. So dimension one, what we do, how do we make sense of the world around us is the science engineering practices. And so there's eight of them and they're numbered, but it's just for identification purposes and it's arbitrary. It's not like one is better than two, it's not a hierarchy. And so if you look at one and six though, there are some color coding. Asking questions is on the science side of things and defining problems is engineering. And for six, constructing explanations is what scientists do. Designing solutions is what engineers do. But in essence, all eight of them, even all the ones colored in white, are for science and engineering. The difference is just in the ones called out. So these are the eight practices. Now, it's really tricky to look at them in a linear fashion, much prefer a circular fashion because what I know about the standards is when you engage students in one of these practices, like let's say I start, let's say my standard calls out constructing explanations as a science engineering practice. Well, am I only gonna be engaging them in that one practice or will I naturally connect to other ones? And the answer is yes, just because your standard may focus on one doesn't mean you're not going to engage in multiple because I might start out by asking questions, which is going to lead me to doing something else, which might lead me back to doing something. And so it's really good to look at it in this kind of fashion. And if you're wondering, well, like, how do I start doing all of this? Um, number 10 in the dashboard has an awesome article from NSTA, National Science Teaching Association, about the practices and putting them in what we call groups. So I'm just gonna walk you through this. Everything we do for sense making and science starts with, um, sorry, we, we have three groups. One is investigating practices, one is sense making practices, and then we have critiquing practices. But all of it starts with engaging students in a phenomena, which is a naturally occurring event in the real world. You saw them looking at condensation and ice on a glass, right? And they put it in ice and water, and then they actually applied it to changing out the liquid and putting it in alcohol. Um, and really it all, it, it's, we have to anchor our learning in figuring something out. It's gonna create curiosity and a need for learning and a need for figuring something out. And once we engage students in this thing called phenomena, you move into investigating practices like asking questions, carrying it out and planning investigations, mathematics. Um, and once you engage in those practices, you end up with the product called data. And what do we do with data? Well, we have to make sense of it. And how do we do that? Well, we do it through modeling, through analyzing data, and through constructing explanations. And the products of doing all of that are explanations and models. And then when we have the models, and then when we have the models, we basically we take our thinking public and we start to critique each other's work in a very collaborative way and, and give feedback to one another so we can revise our ideas. So these are what we call the three categories of science and engineering practices. And the way you build your lessons will have a sequence of sense making. And so that was the first dimension. The second dimension is called the cross-cutting concepts. This is how we think, the lens through which we're gonna think about something and then gather evidence and gather data and gather information that relates to the phenomena. So there's seven of them. Again, the numbers don't mean anything. And so let's just think about like, maybe you're in a weather unit or you're studying something specific with weather. Could we look at patterns and data? 
Or could we look at how one thing causes something else to happen and figure out the mechanism that's causing it? Could we think about scale, proportion, and quantity in weather systems? How about systems and system models? Energy and matter, how energy cycles and flows through a system. Structure and function. So these cross-cutting concepts in our standards are a little bit different than the next generation science standards. In our standards, it is up to you as the Arizona educator to choose the cross-cutting concept you think is best. Ours are not written into the standards the way that NGSS is. So that's one of our major differences. Oh, and stability and change. And so that's just cross-cutting concepts. Now we're gonna get into the third dimension and ours, this is the main reason we are different from NGSS. The way we organized these core ideas is totally different. So we have three buckets here, physical science. And you can see there are four big ideas. These are massive ideas that will spiral over the grades from K through 12. And each time it will increase in, in sophistication and depth of knowledge, right? So these are just what we call the core ideas of knowing science. Think of it like content. So big ideas, there's four of them in physical, two of them in earth and space. Life science, there are four. So all together, we have 10 core ideas of knowing science. It's different than NGSS. NGSS has more. And here is how they are, this is the spiral that we were talking about. Spiral means it might pop up in one grade and then skip a grade or two, it might come back and it might come back. So if you follow P1, it does not happen in kindergarten. Kids are not engaging with this in K1. It comes up in two, comes up in five, comes up in six, eight, et cetera. And so each core idea, if you look at these boxes, here's the grade band, it will be there at least one time. That was, that was the idea. So if you're wondering where to find this document, it is number 11 in the dashboard. So it is in there and it's on our website. Okay, and then we have something else that goes with our third dimension. So we actually have two buckets of core ideas. We have core ideas of knowing content, core ideas of using. So think of like nature of science stuff. This is how we use the science to do something. So what are we doing? So we have something called U1, U2, and U3. I'm going to give you a minute to read over it. I just highlighted a couple things that really pop out. So I'll give you 30 seconds to read this. And so here you can see we have three core ideas of using. So 10 of knowing, three of using. Together, we have 13 core ideas in our third dimension. So when we look at these, you can see U1. This is sense making, where we engage in practices and cross-cutting concepts and explain phenomena. Now, if your standard calls out a U2, you're in engineering world. You're creating products to solve a, a problem, basically. You're engineering a solution. So U2 standards are engineering. U3 is when you're gonna take it, you're gonna apply it to a real world context um, that may have economic, social, political implications. And you're gonna weigh both sides of things before you make a decision. And so really most of our standards are U1s. We have a few U2s and a few U3s. And so, this is a great tool. This is number 12 in the dashboard. If you wanna go ahead and open it so you can kind of look at it and make sure you know exactly where it is. This is called a snapshot. Think of it like a placemat. When you sit down to plan, this is the thing you wanna have out to start with. And so up here, it has all of our three dimensions all in one place. Up here, we have the SEPs, Science and Engineering Practices cross-cutting concepts, how we think about phenomena. And then down here, these two boxes are combined to give us our three dimensions in Arizona. And remember, this is different than the next generation science standards. Dimension one and two, the same as NGSS. Dimension three, very different. 
And so let's talk about how we read a standard. Well, it all starts out the first coding, grade level, kindergarten, second grade. Then we have E1, U1. So that's Earth Science Core Idea 1 using Science Core Idea 1. So if I see a U1, I know we're in sense making land. I'm not doing engineering and I'm not applying and weighing the pros and cons in you know, a situation. So these together, E1, U1, remember that's one dimension. Those are the core ideas combined together. And then the last number is just an identifier. So this is kindergarten standard three. This is second grade standard number four. It's just a way to identify the standard by number. And then we're just gonna show you a little bit more. So E1 would come right from here. That's the big idea it relates to. And then U1 would come from right here. Just wanted to break that down for you so you know how to use this document to start you off. And then here is what the actual science standards look like. I'm sure you've seen these before. This is our standards document. I just grabbed one page to walk you through it. So all of our standards, as we just, heard start with the core ideas of knowing and using. So here's physical science core idea two, using science core idea one. So we're going to be engaging with phenomena, sense making through the practices and all of that. Each of our standards, so here's our actual standard. The blue is a science and engineering practice. It's already called out for you. Every single one of our standards starts with an SEP. Cross-cutting concepts, as I mentioned, are not written into our standards the way the next generation science standards have them written in. Ours are different. You as the educator can choose which one you think fits best. Now, the ones that are bolded are suggested. Those are ones the creators thought might work well. You don't have to use that. It's completely up to you. Now, this part, I want to be very clear about what this part is. This is background information. It is not what you are supposed to teach kids. It is not the list of vocabulary because we're not doing that anymore. We're not just teaching vocabulary. It is not, you're not just gonna go to this and go, oh, that's what I have to teach. No, what this is, is verbatim. The research, not even all of it, most of what was used to create that standard. And so since these two standards are in the same box, this is the research used to create this one and that one. And the way I know that is these in-text citations. Number two means it came from this research document. On number four means it came from here. So this is research. It is not a learning progression. It is not a checkoff list. It is not what you are teaching them. It is for you to get background information of where these standards even came from. And so here's what it looks like in high school. Same setup, here's a standard, but remember this is called an essential. There are 28 of these. Then high school also has what's called the plus standards, as you can see here. The essential are for every single kid in high school. There are 28 covering uh, you know, all the core ideas and that's what they need to be engaged with by the time they leave three credits of high school. The plus standards are there to build out additional coursework, depending on if your district has different pathways for chemistry or biology or anatomy or whatever. They're in addition so that districts can create course pathways. So here, just take a look and read over the difference between essential and plus high school standards. Okay, and I'm gonna ask if people are writing questions to me. Can you please hold off? I am alone here and I don't have support. We have time in a little bit for questions. I cannot answer them. It will be tricky. So the difference is essential means all kids by the end of three credits of high school, it will be on the state science assessment. Plus standards are in addition to those. If you know, states, or sorry, if LEAs or districts needed to create course pathways. They are not assessed by the district or by the state, but your district can make assessments based on those course, path course pathways. And so what I wanted to just dive into is just read over that last thing that what ties all of our standards together, what ties it together is what we call phenomena. And literally phenomena and sense-making 
are on our very first page of our standards in the introduction, but most people completely skip over this. So take a moment and just read the highlighted section real quick. And the reason I wanted to call this out is because most people do skip over this and they just go straight to their standards, which without reading the introduction, but quite frankly, the introduction is the most important part to help you understand what are these three dimensions, what's phenomena, what's sense making. And so um, I'm not going to, we don't have time for this video, but if you want to know a little bit about using phenomena, this is like a three minute video with one of the writers of the framework that's just really good to listen to, like what is phenomena? So I did link that for you in the dashboard. Um, and then if you're still sitting here going, oh my goodness, I don't know about phenomena, I need more time. Remember that we have additional support for you. We have webinars, we have a webinar in each of the three dimensions, and I do one on phenomena-based instruction. How do you use phenomena to build a lesson, build a unit, get kids figuring things out? And then this is just an exit ticket. If you have time to do it, great. If not, that's okay too. But if you're kind of like, I'm not really sure how to identify the dimensions in a standard, I built you a little tool that could help. And it's down here in the exit ticket. And if you have time, great. If not, that's okay. And I spelled force wrong apparently. But what it is is, you basically take a look at some standards and then you're gonna use some color coding. Whenever we talk about the dimensions, the science and engineering practices are blue, cross cuts are green, and the core ideas are orange. You saw it in the video. And what you would do is just go through and highlight this and just see if you can figure out the three dimensions. That's just a little practice on your own if you have time. If you don't, that's okay. I didn't think we'd get to it today. But that is it. So we are at time. I only have two minutes for questions, but we're going to use a strategy called stack, which means if you have a question, all you're going to do is this. You write stack into the chat, and basically it puts people in a line, and I can call on you and say, oh, I see, you know, Lynn's on stack or Judy's on stack. So does anyone have a question before we go? And you can unmute yourself and ask a question. Nobody has questions? This never happens. What's going on? You're all like, I'm done. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> all right, just a reminder, no worries. Um, I'm an email away. Also, if you ever have questions about anything, I'm happy to support. And just a reminder, give me about 24 to 48 hours to uh, put in your attendance and then you can print your certificate from your account and you'll see a follow up email from me um, in the next day or two. So thank you so much. I hope you, you know, learned something here and got some information, had some resources and that's it. Have a great night. Go rewatch uh, Perseverance landing on Mars. That was amazing. All right, take care.